Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. Later on in the show, we will be joined by Dr. Jackie Faraday from the American Museum of Natural History to talk about citizen science, exoplanets, and her hopes for research on JWST. But first, let's take a look back at some of our favorite stories from 2021. This is our first show of a new year, and while every day has been Blur's Day since early 2020, time has actually been ticking forward. And with the new year, it is time to look back and see how our understanding of the universe has changed. In picking our top stories, we had a wealth of new missions, all the new craft at Mars, Lucy, DART. We had more exoplanets than we knew what to do with, and there were volcanoes, earthquakes, and climate change on our planet Earth. While stars went on to flicker and flare across the universe and dark matter was found missing in some places and clumped up in others. Picking our top stories wasn't just about picking the stories we thought would have the greatest impact over time. Some of these stories are just, well, our favorites. Let's start with a look back at Pluto. At last winter's Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference, doctoral researcher Adine Denton presented a new analysis of New Horizons images that hint at Pluto having a 150 kilometer deep ocean beneath its icy crust. For comparison, the deepest point in the Earth's ocean is the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, which is just 11 kilometers deep. These res results are thanks to a new analysis of Pluto's low resolution side. During the New Horizons flyby, the mission got extremely good images on one side of Pluto and low resolution images of Pluto's other side while the mission was further away. There are a lot of tricks of the trade that allow folks to eke out more information from the images and over time, as our software gets better, we're able to process things and learn more. While in reprocessing the low res side of Pluto, they found a fascinatingly located region with a fascinatingly disrupted looking terrain. That location? Exactly opposite from Sputnik Planum, the smooth heart shaped region imaged in such amazing detail. Many researchers have proposed that Sputnik Plan Planum is actually an impact basin. If this is the case, when Pluto was hit by whatever it was hit by, the impact would have generated shock waves that traveled through and around the planet. On other planets, we have seen a crater on one side and a disrupted terrain on the antipode, the opposite side, where the shock waves came together and tossed the land around. Different kinds of land, planetary core material, and stuff in between can all transport these waves in different ways. Denton ran what she calls a small army of Pluto simulations that each had oceans of different thickness and cores of either serpentine or other materials that don't matter because it was a core of serpentine and an ocean 150 kilometers thick that produced the disruptions actually seen, we think, in the low res images of Pluto. This gives Pluto a volume of liquid that isn't too different from the volume occupied by life here on Earth. Subsurface water, we're learning, may be a norm for outer icy worlds, but in 2021, we learned that some of what we thought were subsurface lakes are actually something entirely different. We talk a lot about water on Mars in the planetary science community. It's an important topic. With plans underway to send humans to the red planet, scientists and engineers are concerned about how to provide the necessary resources for a prolonged mission. Water is heavy and fuel is expensive. They make it better for everyone involved if water is already on Mars, accessible, and relatively easy to make drinkable. Last year, there were a lot of stories about water and ice on Mars, it seemed, and there were quite a few trying to figure out just what was under Mars's polar ice caps. Everyone was looking for subsurface water, and one study said they had found it there. That's not the study that caught my attention, though. No, I was fascinated by a follow-up study that said the liquid lakes discovered with bright radar reflections were actually clays with metallic minerals in them. These results do not rule out the possibility 
quantity of liquid water. They just mean that we cannot always make a confident decision based on one possible analytic method if there are other methods available. Think of it this way. Just because you see the glint off a rock in the distance doesn't mean you found gold. So before you bring all your mining equipment over, you might want to make sure you've found the right mineral. Back in 2020, a long gamma ray burst attempting to masquerade as a short gamma ray burst. For just 0.65 seconds, the Fermi gamma ray burst monitor detected something. Zwicky Transient Facility went on to observe a supernova explosion in the same part of the sky, and it's now thought that this was a classic long-duration gamma ray burst that for some reason had an abbreviated duration. It is believed that when some massive stars end their lives as supernovae, something happens that causes powerful jets to form, and those jets funnel gamma rays and other radiation in a narrow cone. When one of those cones happens to be directed at us, we get to see a long duration gamma ray burst lasting up to hundreds of seconds in duration. Hundreds of seconds is longer than 0.65 seconds. The researchers behind this paper believe that the conditions in this event were just at the border of what is necessary to form a gamma ray burst. And what we saw was the system teetering out of the zone that would allow a normal long duration burst. This makes it clear that while all long duration gamma ray bursts are tied to supernovae, not all supernovae can support or sustain a gamma ray burst. At a certain level, we knew that from statistics. There are just too few gamma ray bursts for their scarcity to ex be explained just by how often we are or aren't in the cone of their jets. Now we have seen that transition case the case where something tries really hard to be a gamma ray burst and just doesn't quite make it. You do you, little gamma ray burst. We understand that sometimes we don't all get to scream into the void of the universe for as long as we'd like, and we respect your efforts. And sometimes it's the scientists that want to scream into the void of the universe when the press releases get interpreted in the wildest possible way, as is the case with our next story. In my final favorite story of 2021, a transmitting object was found and confirmed using data from the Dark Energy Survey. The object, called C2014 UN271 Bernard Dinelli Bernstein, was captured in data from 2014, 2016, and 2018, and is a large comet, somewhere between 100 and 370 kilometers in diameter. Its orbit is about 600,000 years, and the furthest distance is at 0.6 light years, an incredibly eccentric or elliptical. And at the end of this decade, it will make its way almost to Saturn's orbit. Of course, that's only part of what made the story so interesting. The big thing was that so, so many headlines were shouting that a giant comet was heading toward Earth. Well, yes, in a manner of speaking, sure, the comet is headed vaguely in the direction of Earth's orbit, as things that are in highly elliptical orbits tend to do as they approach the sun. But this comet will get nowhere near Earth's orbit, let alone near Earth. And... So I had a bit of a rant about misleading headlines and clickbait. Don't fall for them, everyone. As we go into 2022, remember to take sensational headlines with a very large grain of salt. If you have questions about a story you saw somewhere, please ask Dr. Pamela or myself what the facts are, because a lot of news sites are out to get eyeballs and never seem to talk about asteroids and comets when they're not able to call them a potential threat. Discoveries don't just come from big surveys with hundreds of scientists. Sometimes they come from citizen science projects. After the break, we'll be back to talk to Dr. Jackie Faraday about one such recent discovery. One final story to look back at from last year was the discovery of an exoplanet by citizen scientists in the Backyard World's Planet Nine project. This new world is either a massive gas giant or a brown dwarf, and it is an astonishing 1600 AU from its parent star. 
That distance kept the planet from being found during previous exoplanet campaigns. But there it was, just sitting there in the data, waiting to be found. And it was citizen scientists who found it. Joining us now is Dr. Jackie Faraday, senior scientist in the Department of Astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History and the co-founder of the Backyard World's Planet Nine Project and lead author on the resulting paper from the discovery. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Faraday. Thanks for having me, Beth. So how did the Backyard Worlds project come about? Oh, so what happened was I study brown dwarfs. I love these objects that are in between stars and planets. They're cold, so you can't really see them with your eye. And there had been a discovery made by Kevin Lumen, a professor at Penn State University, that recovered the fourth closest object to the sun a very, very cold object. And it's insane that somebody can discover something that's that close to the sun that we missed it. And he found it as a solo author by flipping through thousands of images. And when I saw his paper come out, I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. I want to do this and find something maybe that's closer than the closest star. Maybe, you never know, right? And then Mark Kushner, who's right now the head of citizen science science for nasa i think I he has a fancy title i don't know what it is officially came gave a seminar where i was a postdoc and was talking about his citizen science project disc detective and he had a whole bunch of objects that looked red they were moving and so red and moving could mean cold and close by and he kind of said flippantly to the audience like does anybody want these objects and i was like yeah i'll take them i'm flipping through images my with my own eye and he said, why do you want them? And then him and I went down this, this rabbit hole of conversation where it was like, I want them because I want to find a, an object that might be closer than the closest star. And there's a potential you could find Planet Nine this way. And thus was born the idea that Mark came to me and said, why don't you stop doing that with your eye to try and recreate what this professor at Penn State was doing, which was insane. And let's invite citizen scientists to help us flip through images and find objects that are nearby, that are cold, that move, that were undetected in catalogs, and uh, thus was born the Backyard Worlds Project. So explain how this particular uh, object was found, this 1600 AU distant uh, planet, brown dwarf. Yeah, right. It doesn't have a great name. I love this object so much. So the way that our project works is that we have a Zooniverse site where we ask users to click through images. We, we blink four different images for them, separated by a couple of years. There's like a five to seven year epic difference between them. And if an object moves over the course of a couple of years, which it will do if it's close to you, um, we ask the users to click it and then send it to us. But now we've got a troop of what we call super users. These are citizen scientists that are just super invested in the project. Right. And for them that have a lot of contact with us, with the research team, it's no longer just Mark and myself. There's two other scientists, uh, Aaron Meisner and Adam Schneider, who are also the co-founders of the project. And the four of us, make up the research core team. We've got an extended research team. And these super users will blink through images, make a discovery, and then they they submit it via this Google form that we've given them. We said, you guys seem to be like super good at what you're doing. So submit it via this Google form. They submit it. It goes into our email and we note those objects. It's actually been noted by um, a citizen scientist in Germany Mm -hmm. named Jorg Schulman, and Jorg brought it to our attention. And we had had it for a couple of years. I just hadn't had a chance to follow it up yet. And I had an observing run last Christmas, and I was like, this object looks interesting. It's co-moving with this star. It's faint. I plopped it in to the target list for the night. And when the data came back, I was like, what is this? This is an awesome cold object that looks super young. And if you're cold and young, those two things go together nicely. Cold meaning like low temperature object, much, much less temperature than a star is. 
Uh, and young, just a couple of million years old, means that you're right at the boundary of being called a planet. And so I saw the spectrum, saw the data come from the from the telescope. I looked at it and I couldn't believe that I didn't understand why it was so young. And then we we went down the rabbit hole to the object. And Jorg was so excited. The citizen scientist in Germany who had discovered it. Oh, I told him right away. I was like, Jorg, you found an awesome one. <laughs> and uh, and thus went our excitement around, you know, the 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 discussion of discovery. And these citizen scientists who, who helped you with this discovery, Jorg in particular, of course, uh, they're credited on the paper, correct? Oh, yeah, they're co-authors. Mm -hmm. So on this particular paper, there's several citizen scientists that are on the paper. Um, Jorg, of course, is a, a very high up co-author because he's the one that discovered the object. Dan Hasselden, who's another citizen scientist, is a fantastic citizen scientist. He's basically become a core science team member. He's also on the paper. And we credit the entire back world collaboration. But if you find an object, you're a part of our team, you can get a, a refereed astrophysical journal paper out of, out of it. You get your name in the big lights of astrophysical journals, as we call it, right? <laughs> that is so fantastic. And I, I love citizen science stories like this. So I want to talk to you some more about some science you have coming up. But we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with Dr. Faraday. Welcome back. I am here with Dr. Jackie Faraday of the American Museum of Natural History. Now, Jackie, I understand um, that you are involved with the JWST. So what is the research that you have that you're going to be doing with our new telescope? Oh, well, this links heavily to the to the um, object we were just talking about. Um, so I have I had nothing to do with the construction of the telescope. I had nothing to do with the launch, but I was one of the principal investigators selected for time in cycle one of the telescope. Once its eyes open in roughly 140 ish days or so, and we start getting data for our proposals, uh, the project that I got time for is to go after very cold brown dwarfs, objects that are right at the door of being called a planet. They're very much like Jupiter. And I want to study their atmospheres. And two of the objects that I got time for came from the Citizen Science Project Backyard Worlds. We had a couple of citizen scientists that were responsible for the discovery of a couple of these cold objects that bang on the door of being called a planet that probably have an atmosphere that's a lot like Jupiter. But the thing is that they have no host star because they're all by themselves. So, you know, we don't really know what the basement is of the planetary formation, the stellar formation prop, right. uh, process and the cap on the planet formation process. So you talk about objects that just give you a big gray area as to the definition of the word planet. And these are the objects on the cold, cold side. So they're not young, like the object that I was just, just talking about that Jorg discovered. They're older. And because they're older, they're more like Jupiter. And they're just a couple hundred, maybe 200 degrees Kelvin, warmer than Jupiter. So we are going to take that James Webb Space Telescope we are going to look carefully at those objects. We've been begging for photons from them, from instruments that we've had to date. And JWST is kind of like turning the fountain on. And we're going to get a pouring in of data on these objects. And we're going to be able to study their atmospheres. And these are very much like worlds beyond our own solar system formed outside of our solar system, probably a lot like Jupiter. Do you have any hopes or expectations about what you might find out? I think what we're going to be able to nail down is what causes the diversity in exoplanet atmospheres. So the one thing that, you know, is uh, it's going to be a wrench in everyone's plan when they want to study. Um, we want to study exoplanets is what the clouds are doing. So what's, you know, what's the weather today kind of thing um, mm -hmm. or what, what happens if you change the chemistry ever so slightly in the object? 
And I have selected um, a very specific number of objects that I think are anchored is very similar in temperature. But what I'm going to find out about them is what a slight change in the weather related phenomenon will do to them or what a slight change in the metallicity or uh, the chemistry of the source might do to it or what a slight change in the gravity or the age of the object might do. So I really want to nail down diversity. What is going to show itself in the form of diversity in exoplanets, gas giants formed beyond our solar system? Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for answering my questions. You're welcome, Beth. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX.